Jesus says in there, I didn't die because you were bad. I died to make a point. What kind of God would say, I'm very pissed at you, but Jesus, if you suffer enough, I'll be happy. So let's talk about the esoteric interpretation. Something's got to change because we're headed for collective disaster, global catastrophe. There's a tremendous spiritual revolution going on at this time. People are seeking the evolution of the human race. Miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. When we're thinking with love, we are literally co-creating with God. When you put short-term profits for huge corporate entities, before whether or not a child is safe, whether or not food is safe, whether or not we live in peace, then something has gone very, very wrong. And how can we not be depressed about that? If I deny the reality of all that, I'm not even in it, that's cheap and easy spirituality. If I'm in it and I'm willing to do what I can, then you're talking about transfiguration and transmutation. And that's the evolution of the human race. So we have three options. There was a book that came out years ago by Elaine Pagels called The Gnostic Gospels. And it talks about the early days of Christendom. And in the early years after uh, the birth of Jesus, there were two main tributaries of thought. At that point, there were two main rivers of thought. And one had to do with what would become the ecclesiastic tradition, institutionalized church, organized religion, doctrine, and dogma with the idea that there is a priesthood or a ministerial class that is kind of brokering your relationship to Jesus and to God. But there was also, in the early days, an equally powerful um, interpretation of the life of Jesus that had to do with the Spirit being within us and that we did not. The idea was that we did not need an external broker, that the Spirit of God spoke to us through a small, still voice within now, much of the ecclesiastic tradition um, would have us think that, oh, this mystic stuff really was just a little tributary. But what Elaine Pagels talks about based on archaeological research is that it was not, in fact, a small tributary. And this is why the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Nag Hammadi manuscripts were so important. But also there had been mystics throughout uh, history uh, St. Teresa of Avila, Gerard de Sardin, and others, who have talked about the more esoteric rather than the exoteric dimensions of the religious life, namely the purely spiritual. So within all the great religious traditions, there is the spiritual dimension. In Judaism, uh, mystical Judaism is the Kabbalah. In Islam, mystical tradition is Sufism. All the great religious teachings have this inner dimension. And some of the people who had been most interested in the inner spirituality of the great religious systems have actually not been interested in the dogma, have not been interested in the external institutions, have not been interested in the doctrine, etc. And that is as true about Jesus as about any other religious figure. Now, I'm a student of a, a set of books called The Course in Miracles. And The Course in Miracles uses traditional Christian terms including the notion of Jesus, but in very non-traditional ways. Jesus is not seen as a religious figure, but as a spiritual force, not as an exclusive way to God, uh, the only way to God, but rather as something universally available uh, among others. So um, it's interesting because I've been told by my publisher that a big uh, questioning among book buyers was, do you have anything about Jesus that's not specifically a Christian book. So when the publisher came to me and asked me, would you be interested uh, as a Course in Miracles student, I was like, yeah, I have a few things to say on the subject. It's really interesting to feel into these different texts and it seems like the awareness around them, like you said, people are asking more about, hey, is there anything that's not as biblical but still on the topic of Jesus? It, it seems to be that people are opening up to a different awareness of Jesus, particularly at this time. Um, can you speak to potentially why that may be the case? Well, first of all, I don't think it's that people are not interested in lines out of the Bible, but they're interested in a broader interpretation of lines that are within the Bible. Why? Because people are not stupid. We're six inches from the cliff environmentally. 
in terms of nuclear bombs, in terms, I mean, there are so many ways in which any intelligent observer looks at the world today and goes, something's got to change because we're headed for collective disaster, global catastrophe. If something fundamental doesn't turn around, you know, Gandhi said the problem with the world is that humanity is not in its right mind. So I think people are not once again, and some people are finding their genuine spiritual sustenance within organized religion. I'm not saying that they're not. And, men, and that's true of A Course in Miracles, too. Uh, many students of The Course in Miracles are grounded within specific religious institutions. The students of The Course and, and the real the disciples of God, The Course in Miracles, say, come from all religions and no religion. People are seeking, whether they perceive it this way or not, on a conscious level, the evolution of the human race. That's what your show is about. Now, when we were children, we were all taught about evolution. And we were taught that if a, a species gets to the point where its collective behavioral patterns are maladaptive for its survival, that something's going to happen. It's either going to go extinct or there will be the introduct introduction of a mutation, a different way. And even though that different way does not at the beginning represent a majority of the members of the species, it represents what is ultimately the only survivable option. And in the species that evolves and thrives, they, they choose the direction of the alternative. And that's how I see the great religious masters. There's only one truth spoken in many different ways. It has to do with love. It has to do with infinite compassion. It has to do with mercy. It has to do with um, humility before a higher power. And that is the alternative. Love is the other way. And when people say, well, we tried that, well, no, we actually haven't. And um, that is the evolutionary alternative that is the only survivable option on the planet now. You speak to the present paradigm of anxiety quite deeply throughout the book um, that the world is currently living on and this cliff face that you're describing here. Um, and the, the, the relationship with how we see a mental health calamity on our hands, but you take it a step further in saying that actually at its zenith, mental health and spirituality are almost one and the same. And that actually it is a, it is a spiritual uh, call to arms that we're, we're being invited to. We call it a mental health crisis, but in essence, it's a spiritual crisis. It's not, people are having a hard time living comfortably on this planet, not only in terms of our to the ex material conditions of far too many people, but also the psychological and the emotional um, stress and anxiety that is produced by living in a world where so much separation between us and among us is fostered, where there's such disconnection from a sense of community, a disconnection from a sense of deep relational responsibility to other people and to other species and to the earth itself. Modern capitalism, the strain of capitalism that dominates so much of the Western world is one in which economic values are placed before humanitarian values. And in whether it has to do with healthcare, whether it has to do with education, whether it has to do with economic access, to economic opportunities, whether it has to do with climate, whether it has to do with foreign policy, it places us in a situation where too often people are living with chronic stress and chronic anxiety, um, and then we call it a mental health crisis. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a line in The Course in Miracles where it says that religion and psychotherapy at their peak are the same thing. Enlightenment is a healing of the mind. And when you put short-term profits for huge corporate entities before whether or not a child is safe, whether or not food is safe, whether or not uh, we live in peace among nations, then something has gone very, very wrong. And how can we not be depressed about that? It's interesting because I speak to quite a range of people on the podcast and um, it does seem to be that now more so than ever, because as a coach, I also see the fact that breakdown to breakthrough is, is a common is a common part of the human experience. Um, and then I sort of like to, well, I would like to imagine if I met like made that a bit more meta that the world is probably going down through a breakdown to breakthrough. But speaking to a range of people on the podcast, it seems less sure 
um, that we will actually break through to the other side unless there is a significant change in the way that we're operating as a species? Well, it sh- it shows greater maturity that more people are considering the possibility that we won't break through. You know, five years ago, more people would say, well, you know, breakdown always leads to breakthrough. Not necessarily, actually. Um, there is a limit past which uh, certain behavioral be- patterns become unworkable. If the addict does drugs too much, they just might overdose. If the alcoholic drinks too much, they just might die from it. And the same is true with the fragile bonds, the ecosystem of human civilization. So we have three options. Either we continue with such recklessness and such irresponsibility towards each other, towards the earth, towards future generations, that we do cause great global cataclysm, nuclear or or otherwise, in which case probably the planet will not be habitable for the next 200, possibly even longer, 1,000 years. That's certainly one option. Uh, Option two, which is certainly far preferable, is that we wise up that enough of us realize, and we don't need a majority, we just need a critical mass, um, the urgency of the situation, and uh, do what it takes in our own way um, to actually cause the turnaround. Uh, The third option is not everybody dies. A few uh, enough are left to start over. You know, it's interesting, I have to tell you, if you read uh, uh, King Carey's book many years ago uh, that came out called, um, what was it called, The Third Millennium? You know what he says in that book? He says he does not see good things up ahead, and he says the cradle of civilization where things will be saved and will be reborn from, you know where he says? Australia. Really? But I think we'd all agree that it would be far preferable for the whole thing not to fall down to such an extent that one portion of the world has to hold the whole thing. Uh, But thank you in advance if you do. Um, You know, one of the uh, reinterpretations from an esoteric perspective in the Bible has to do with the idea of an Armageddon. So the traditional religious perspective on Armageddon is that there's this great war Uh, between the forces of good and evil, and at the end, there's the appearance of Jesus and then a thousand years of peace. Well, if you look at the esoteric uh, interpretation of the Armageddon, it's the following. One person's Armageddon is they're having to get sober. Another person's Armageddon was get their divorce. Another person's Armageddon was their cancer diagnosis. Another person's Armageddon was uh, the loss of a child whatever, that led people through such a, a, a cracking open, such a disintegration and reintegration of self that they achieved the peace that could only have come from that. Then the idea is that if you take the wisdom from your Armageddon and I take the wisdom from my Armageddon and somebody else takes the wisdom from their Armageddon and we have enough of a collective field of wisdom that we will then bypass the collective Armageddon because it won't be necessary. Enough of us will have learned the lesson and have shown up for the task of fundamental change. It reminds me of, I remember this um, this Buddhist practice of Tonglen, which, yeah, just it got me, it rubbed me up the wrong way the first time I was introduced to it, to be honest. It was, and I got it from uh, Tara Brack reading Radical uh, Self-Acceptance mm-hmm. or Radical Acceptance. And mm-hmm. up until that point, I'd been doing these meditations where you breathe in the love and you let out the stress. You breathe in the light and you let out the stress. You know, breathe in <laughs> the good, let out the bad. And right. uh, in this, at this point in this, uh, in this radical self-acceptance, one of the exercises in the meditation she gives, and we should talk about some of the meditations and prayers you have in, in the Mystic Jesus, my God. Um, one of the practices she gives in there um, is, uh, is to breathe in all the darkness and the suffering of the world and breathe out light. And it just rubs your initial common sense sensibilities up the wrong way. And it, like my guard went up immediately and I was like, what? why would I, why would I take on more pain and suffering? And her wisdom was actually as a human being, you have the opportunity to transmute, right? Like this is actually a big part of your work um, here on the planet. And like you're describing, like us going through our individual Armageddons to actually bring that wisdom together to actually Not bypass all- a particular, uh, sorry. Yeah, please. 
not only the individual pain and suffering, but the pain and suffering of the world. As, as uh, Werner Erhard used to point out, that peacock feathers are made by the fact that peacocks eat thorns. If you don't take in the suffering, it's like you're skipping right to the resurrection and forgetting the crucifixion. It's like you're skipping right into the entrance into the promised land and forgetting that the Israelites were enslaved by Pharaoh. It, this is not transcendence. This is denial. So when you take in the suffering of the world, it's like the Christians, the Christian tradition, the Good Friday service before Easter. You were refusing to deny the suffering. There is no religious or spiritual tradition that gives us a pass on addressing the suffering of other sentient beings. That's the shadow side of the modern higher consciousness movement. Real spiritual journey is not, let's be happy, let's be happy. It's let's be happy not because we are ignoring the suffering of other sentient beings, but because we are doing our part to transmute it. So she's absolutely right in, in, from a spiritual perspective. You being willing to eat. Uh, you, it's all of our job. We will, that's what Kali does. You, know, you eat up the suffering of the world. Um, and the acknowledgement of the darkness is, it, you know, the Course in Miracles talks about positive denial. Negative denial is when I don't even see it. I don't even see it. It's not real. I don't see it. Positive denial is I see it but I deny you power over me because I know ultimately you are the illusions. But as a human being, I'm standing here in the midst of this three-dimensional hell and within it, within it, if I deny the reality of all that, I'm not even in it. That's cheap and easy spirituality. If I'm in it and I'm willing to eat it and I'm willing to do what I can, then you're talking about transfiguration and transmutation. And that's the evolution of the human race. Hey you, Marianne is absolutely incredible and we're about to dive in even deeper into the mystical stories of Jesus. Now, you're loving this channel, you're returning for the first, second, third, fourth time to watch another Inspired Evolution video. I wanna take a quick sec to invite you, please, to subscribe to the channel. Everything you see around here is powered and empowered by your subscription to the channel. Thank you so much in advance for taking a moment. I'll take a moment with you to hit subscribe just down below. Thank you so much for your love and support. And without too much further ado, back to Marianne. I'm a big fan of story and especially mystical stories. And I never really looked at, well, obviously you wrote the book as the mystic Jesus to in illuminate um, the mystical concepts um, potentially behind the story of Jesus. And one of my one of my favorite little contemplations since reading the book has been the uh, has been the concept of the crucifixion, which you were just mentioning, um, as being this. And maybe I shouldn't put words in your mouth and allow you to illustrate the point a little bit better. But the crucifixion being this, you know, a, a demonstration of how far the ego will go, and the resurrection being how far the love of God can actually go. Can you like pad that out? Because I've just yeah, maybe I've ruined the punchline part of me for that. No, I, I'd be glad to, but I, I'd like to go back if I might, because you mentioned Buddha before. Uh, and I think in terms of the story, there's a very big piece of this. Well, it's in all the great religious teachings of the world. Please. But the Buddha story of Siddhartha, when uh, the Prince Siddhartha was born, his father, who was a great warrior king, went to the astrologer, right? and was told, your son will become a great religious leader. This made Siddhartha's father angry. I don't want my son to be a great religious figure. I want my son to be a great warrior king. So what he decided to do was to build a castle compound. And within that compound, the son would never experience a lack of pleasure. He would have musicians. He would have dancers. He would have artists. He would have teachers. He would have women when he grew older. Anything that could possibly contribute to his pleasure. He would never see anything that was in any way would make him suffer. Now, it's interesting, the story there, because his father therefore knew if he sees human suffering, he might in fact become a religious figure. When Sid Arthur got older, he just had this feeling in his heart there was more to all this. So one night he escaped, he escaped, he walked over the walls, and that's when he saw human suffering for the first time. He came back, and all of his teachers and dancers and beautiful people who were around him 
were asleep because it was the middle of the night. When he saw them up close, he saw they too had sores and sicknesses and, and, and broken bodies. And that's when he crossed for the last time. Once his heart had been cracked open by seeing human suffering. So these stories, once again, they have such inner dimensions. Now, in terms of the crucifixion and the resurrection, you know, when I was a younger woman, and, and I'm Jewish, so these stories never, I, I wasn't taught them as this is true anyway. It was like, we read the other book, honey. But mm. one thing that I never understood was this idea that Jesus died for your sins. What kind of God would say, I'm very pissed at you, but Jesus, if you suffer enough, I'll be happy. What, what, what kind of God is this? Okay. So let's talk about the esoteric interpretation of this. The Course in Miracles, Jesus says in there, I didn't die because you were bad. I died to make a point. I died as a radical demonstration that nothing that is not love has ultimate effect. So you take the most radical example of lovelessness, and lovelessness is that which is without God because God is love. So the ultimate example of lovelessness, what could be more of an ultimate example than the torture and the brutal murder of a completely innocent man who had done nothing to hurt anyone and so much to help so many. So the crucifixion is an example of all the things we go through in our lives where lovelessness seeks to destroy us, to demean us, to mock us, whether it's to make fun of us, to destroy our careers, to make us sick, or even to kill us. It takes three days, which means the period of time for the, the mortal world to catch up to the change of consciousness that was exhibited during the period of crucifixion. Are you going to get lost in anger, or are you going to seek to forgive? Are you going to make this the victory of you becoming a better person, or are you going to go into victim and blame? The resurrection is the shift that then occurs because love always gets the final sigh. You become a bigger person because of it. Um, you grow, you learn, situations shift, things come around. And when you're in that period where it seems like fear or lovelessness defeated you, and my friend Sandy calls it tomb time, it's when the body of Jesus was in the tomb. Now, it's interesting because three days later, the women went to retrieve the body. And the angel said, he's not here, he has risen. Now, this is fascinating in a psychological sense because it means the you that went through the crucifixion doesn't even exist anymore. Because the Course in Miracles says the Christ in you cannot be crucified. Once you move through it, to the point where it has no power over me. Your meanness to me has no power over me. I have completely forgiven you. I've completely forgiven myself. I have grown in faith. The person, the person I was that could even be hurt by you doesn't even exist anymore. Now, he also says in The Course in Miracles, I don't, I'm not asking you to join me in the crucifixion. I don't need martyrs. I need teachers. I'm asking you to join me in the resurrection. It is finished. It's done. I don't need you to go reenact it. I, mine was the last example necessary. I took it all the way to death, he says. So you don't have to reenact it. I don't need you to be up on your cross for me. I don't want to have to be what you need being victim. Demonstrate that, uh, he says in the course, demonstrate that I did not die in vain by demonstrating that I did not die. Demonstrate that it's handled. You know that song, I shall be released, just completely to affirm that uh, this is going to be okay. It's interesting as well as you're sharing this with me now, I'm recognizing that one of the 
final things before he went into tomb time um, was this radical forgiveness that he is, you know. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Right. It's arguably one of the most notable lines in the human zeitgeist (laughs) since since 2,000 years ago. And, um, yeah, just even the way you described it in the book, I, I never really thought about forgiveness that way in the way that it is the illusion that actually it, forgiveness is an illusion that helps us transcend the illusion like that that is yeah. whoa. he says that's the last illusion can you unpack that for me please yeah yeah well forgiveness me okay so the old-fashioned exoteric concept of, of forgiveness is you were a jerk but i'm so spiritual I'm so spiritual, you lowly. No, that the Course in Miracles says, that's actually judgment. That's notion of spiritual superiority. Real forgiveness is when you realize only love is real. So you made a mistake. You fell asleep to the truth of who you are. You fell asleep to the truth of who I am. I've done it myself. But I can choose to extend my perception Beyond what my physical eyes and ears perceive, what you said to me, that look on your face, I don't have to stay stuck there. Because that's if it's not a loving smile that you gave me and loving behavior, it's not real anyway. I can choose to extend my perception beyond what my physical senses perceive to what my heart knows to be true. I rem- you, cho- you fell asleep to either who I was or who you were, which ultimately is the same thing. You fell asleep to my innocence. You fell asleep to your enlightenment. I can choose to remain awake. And in that, I both free myself from the effects of your nightmare and I wake you up. That's what forgiveness is. So forgiveness, the Course in Miracles talks about how the the warden can't leave the prison any more than the prisoner can. I'm not free as long as I'm holding you to my idea of what you should be like. So the only only way I can free myself is to free you. That's why the Course in Miracles says, um, the teacher of God becomes generous out of self-interest. What is that? Somebody says, there's some famous you know line where somebody says, unforgiveness is like giving the other person poison, but you're drinking it, something like that. If I'm attacking you, I'm attacking myself because ultimately there's only one of us here. There's no place where I stop and you start. That is the esoteric meaning of the line. Another one, the traditional meaning of the line, there is only one begotten son. Jesus is it, nobody else. The esoteric or mystical interpretation of that line is that there's only one of us here. There's no place where you stop and I start. The Course in Miracles says you are like sunbeams thinking you are separate from other sunbeams. You are like waves in the ocean thinking you're separate from other waves. Now think about this psychologically. If I'm a wave, this has to do with self-perception. The Course in Miracles says enlightenment is a shift in self-perception from body identification to spirit identification. So think about it this way. If I think of myself as one wave in the ocean separate from all the other waves, How can I not live in constant terror that I will be annihilated by another wave? How can I not live in constant terror that the ocean's going to do something and I'm out? But if I shift my self-perception to, wait a minute, there's no place where I stop and the other waves start, so I'm one with the ocean, baby. I move, it moves. That's how powerful I am. The ocean moves, I go along with it. I'm safe here. A completely different sense of self and the difference between inner peace and complete anxiety. Hey there, guys. Just taking a quick sec out to ask you a quick question. What do you think happened to Jesus in the lost years between the ages of 12 and 30? 18 years blipped out. Did you know that we don't know what happened to Jesus? Uh, One of the most, well, the most historical figure, arguably, um, during those years. I'd love to get your thoughts. My favorite interpretation is actually that he was over in India doing some stuff and also went to Egypt. Who knows? What have you heard? Um, And even just your insights on uh, some of the more Gnostic text what have you taken away i'd love to hear from you in the comments below back to today's episode the persistence of the ego illusion that separates us is a volatile and 
heavily entrenched one, though. Oh, to say the least. And well, the Course in Miracles says a thought system based on fear and separation has dominated the planet for millions of years. It points out, it says in the Bible, it says that Adam fell asleep, and nowhere does it say that he woke up. And this is, we're just beginning the Great Awakening. It says no Great Awakening has occurred, but for the reasons that you and I were talking about at the beginning of the program, any thinking person knows, well, it better start happening. I was going to say that is the solution you espouse in the book, which is it is where we're ready for the collective awakening, and it's almost like yesterday, please. <laughs> I'm reading a book right now, and it's talking about China and Russia and Iran and the United States, okay? It's freaking insane. But if you think about the people of Russia and the people of Iran and the people of China and the people of the United States, the people of Australia, the people of Africa, the people of Europe, we just want to, hi! Hi! So being awake to that, remember, when you say China, then say the Chinese people, you're talking about two completely different things. And I, listen, I'm very clear. You talk about the U.S. government, and then you talk about the American people. And they, they're from those two identities stem parallel realities that are very different. One is filled with decent people, intelligent people, I don't care where you are, who really just want to have a decent life and make life good for their kids. And then the other is the machinery of the collective ego, backed by tremendous powers of money and material force. Um, the Course in Miracles says the ego is suspicious at best and vicious at worst. And it's like addiction. It doesn't just wish to inconvenience you. It wishes to kill you. So being awake to who we really are, then somebody said, but what can we do about it? You don't have to know what to do about it originally. That's why when you said at the beginning of this conversation that more and more people are saying we might not break through, and I said, well, that's mature. I prefer that to what it used to be, which is, well, you know, it's going to be a breakthrough. And I'd be like, not necessarily, guys. You know, that's why with your friend who's a, a, an addict or your friend who's an alcoholic, you stage an intervention. People who love that person say, we're not going to watch you kill yourself. We're going to do something. You need to go to rehab, and we're not going to stand and watch this. And that's the, the consciousness of the adult in the room. I'm just waiting for that to land. <laughs> society is changing from a, <laughs> society yeah. is changing from a material reality to a spiritual reality. Um, you, I, I like in the way I like the way you put it. It's, we're going from little R to big R. Um, I just kind of want to tuck that point in here because I think it's a great little mental model to have in our minds as we're walking around this awakening that we're going through. It's like, yep, this is reality as I know it, and we can call it little R to a bigger reality that's actually. Or more all-pervading? Well, that's straight from The Course in Miracles. There is this three-dimensional world. And yes, of course, it's real. It's real that I'm on my headphones and you're on your headphones and this is a podcast. Of course, it's real. But this entire three-dimensional reality is like a screen in front of a, of a reality that the physical senses do not perceive, but which the heart knows to be true. It also talks about the self with a small s rather than the self with a big s, much like we were talking about before. There's the, the self of the body, body identification. Yes, I was born and I'm going to die and I'm an American and you're an Australian and you're a man and I'm a woman and you're your religion and I'm my religion. That's who I am. That's ourselves. But the Course in Miracles says that's not your real self with a capital S. Your real self with a capital S is spirit, not body. Your physical birth was not the beginning of your life, but the continuation. Your physical death is not the end of your life, but a continuation. And there's actually, although in the realm of time and space, you're in Australia and I'm in D.C., in the world of ultimate reality, it's quantum and there's no separation between us whatsoever. It's a complete, and really, it's the esoteric meaning of Jesus turning the other cheek. Turning the other cheek means he saw with a different eye. <laughs> You mentioned that this place isn't home um, and there is a spiritual true home for us. Um, 
Can you describe a little bit about the nature of that hope? Yeah. You know, I read a book many years ago called The Paradise Myth. I think that was the name of it. And it was the idea that in every religious tradition, there's the idea of paradise. There's the idea that there is a realm and there's some beautiful language in The Course in Miracles, and I, I don't remember the specific, but something about how it's a melody that you can never quite get out of your mind. It's a melody that haunts you. It's a memory that haunts you. Um, I saw a movie once called Deja Vu, and there was some term, he said it means the memory of something that none of us can put our finger on, but we all know. The closest you get, like, do you have children? You, Emery, do you have children? <laughs> yeah, I do. I've the got a three-year-old time... and a six-month-old. Oh, mm. the first, okay. Well, hello. <laughs> Six-month, yeah. You know what paradise is. Falling in love, with... I assume you have a wife, right? Yeah, she's doing awesome. When you fell in Pleasure. love. We've all had those moments. And that's the moment when the gap between heaven and earth, heaven and earth became as one. Which, once again, biblical line reinterpreted. Heaven and earth shall become as one means they will no longer exist as two separate states. We will live on the earth, but think only the thoughts of heaven, which is how Jesus is described. So when you first held your baby in your arms, when you first fell in love with your wife, I always say we've all been there in somebody's arms. Somebody's brass new experience that, right? Where and, and, and often we've said in those times, this is heaven. This is heaven. And we've also been in situations fighting conflict and so forth and said, this is fucking hell. Because it is. Where lovelessness is where lovelessness reigns is hell. Where love is, is heaven. I think for those people that haven't read a course in miracles, um, one of the big takeaways for me from a course in miracles was the fact that miracles actually occur downstream from a lot of little micro tweaks to your perceptions and your behaviors. And it's like, oh, and then a miracle sort of awakens almost into your life. Um, which at first glance, when you think of the word miracle is not really the, the collective sort of awareness on what a miracle is. A miracle is almost like thundercrack, bang, miracle. <laughs> right? um, yeah, it's not and, necessarily the eureka moment. Yeah. And I sort of want to just introduce that into the conversation quickly because I can, I can, potentially hear that people that haven't read A Course in Miracles are probably like, well, we, if we are going through so much right now, maybe a miracle will occur. But maybe speak to the nature of a miracle because you do say like, well, miracle, like, well, you know, I've heard you introduce, like reaffirm that miracle, miracle mindedness is, is kind of right mindedness um, in some ways. Yes, not in some ways, in all ways. So the, the, when we are thinking with love, God is love. So when we're thinking with love, we are literally co-creating with God. You know how in the fairy tales, so the young maiden, whoever she is in the, in the fairy tale, walks through the forest, all the birds, all the deer, all the animals come and they love her and they're taking care of her. That's a symbol for the world just works when you're in love. People, when you love, people are nicer to you. <laughs> I mean, when you're kind, it, it's like common sense. The world more works. Um, the other day I came out of my bedroom and I was thinking of things from my presidential campaign and I was indulging a thought. I could say in a book what, that that was a lie that he said. Now I, I could say in a book, I could say in that documentary, that was a freaking lie and I could come and I could say it, blah, blah, blah. And as I'm thinking these things, the hot coffee that I'm making falls on my hand and all over the counter. Because when I went there, the universe got thrown off. I, the, I introduced disharmony into the molecular structure of things. It was like, I got it. Sorry. Right? I got it. Or when you, you're angry and you stub your finger in the cabinet, everything emanates. But if you're loving and gracious, the Course in Miracles says miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. Miracles are supposed to happen when they do not occur, something has gone wrong. And all that goes wrong is the nature of somebody's thinking. Not only that, not only is the universe programmed 
to work. The universe is also programmed to self-correct, which is another way of saying God has the answer to every problem, the problem the moment occurs. So the Course in Miracles uh, describes the universe, and this is an imagery I'm using, but it's the philosophy, which is much like a GPS. If you take the wrong turn, the GPS automatically recalibrates. So even if you're in a situation where lovelessness reigns, you know, where life is, you know, not always the easiest thing, we're not always in control of the situation we find ourselves in, but we are in charge and fully responsible for who we choose to be in the space of what happened, right? Like I ran for president. If I choose, I could become one resentful, bitter, kind of pathetic old woman, you know, and there would be people, you're right, Marianne, I feel that way, blah, blah, blah. That's an option, but I have another option. Work it. You're going to have to forgive yourself and others, and you're going to have to go through in each situation, and you're going to have to see your part, and you're going to have to atone for your part, and you're going to have to forgive others for theirs. It's the only way, and if you do that, you'll actually be better and your life will be better, and you will grow, and a divine alchemy will occur, completely your choice. And and that alchemical um, processing from fear to love of forgiveness is not, it's not always easy, but that's your your evolution right there. Because like you said, this stuff's been around for so long, and I also think we're living in a mean moment. Social media, everybody jacuz. We need an ethical revolution. I don't know how it is in Australia, but here in the United States, something just people it's don't ask what's the right thing to It is treacherous. It's like people aren't asking, what's the loyal thing to do? This has been what's what is the loyal thing to do? What is the, 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 the behavior that represents character? It's all, how can I win? How can I protect my brand? How can I get ahead? How can I exploit mm-hmm. the, to, the situation to manifest my goals? My God. One of the pieces I read in uh, The Mystic Jesus that really has stayed with me and I think is one of those pieces that will stay with me for a while. And thank you so much for, for putting this down in there. I must have chosen wrongly because I am not at peace. Um, it sounds very much like a Course in Miracles <laughs> nugget. That is the um, Course in Miracles, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, the, the the miracle that is is contrition, I guess, um, you know, going back. and But maybe you can, yeah, you can you can unpack that for us if you don't mind. I must have chosen wrongly because I am not at peace. I think that speaks very much to what you're saying at the moment. So G, uh, Buddha was born about 500 years before Jesus. And Buddha described karma, action for every action, there's a reaction. Jesus said, yes, but in a moment of grace, the karma is burned. And the moment of grace is where you say, I get it. I get it. The Course in Miracles says, only what you have not, are not given can be lacking in any situation. And it says you have to take 100% responsibility for your life experience, and you pay a very high price if you don't. And the high price you pay is that you won't be able to change it. So some of the people would come to me for counseling. And they'd say, well, 90% of this problem was the other person. And I would say, well, we have to look at the 10% that was yours. So, for instance, in the situation I just went through, they lied. They were thieves. They were blah, blah, blah. My question, yeah, why did you hire them to begin with? Where was your unconsciousness? Where, Where were your mistakes? Where, where did you behave in a way that let in the craziness? So I'm not at peace. I must have decided wrongly. You know, the, the one thing you never want to listen to is somebody saying, oh, don't feel bad. Sometimes you need to feel the disturbance because only a sociopath feels no regret or remorse. So when your heart is disturbed, it's like, oh, I made a mistake. And I have to see this and I have to own it. And I might have hurt someone. I might have, you know, where was my part? Um, in 
in, once again, going back to these religious principles, it's what confession is in Catholicism. Catholicism. It's what Yom Kippur is in Judaism. Uh, Yom Kippur is the day of the atonement. It's the holiest day of the year in the Jewish calendar. I, I apologize for the moments I overate, for the moments I said an unkind word, uh, for the moment I forgot my, to pick up my kid at school. You know, so the Catholics do it as they go along, and the Jews have this one day. It, atoning is so important. And sometimes we make the mistake of trying to, um, you know, like when somebody says, oh, don't feel bad. Sometimes you need to feel bad. You need to feel, yeah, I did that. I chose wrongly. But then remember the whole prayer is, I can go back to that moment, recognize I did not allow the Holy Spirit to walk in front of me. I did not allow myself to think, what are you doing? To be prayerful, to be reflective, to put kindness first to myself and others, to be responsible, to be mature. I own, and then the Course in Miracles is you go back to that moment and you say, I didn't get it right then, but I am willing to let the Holy Spirit enter now. Remember in the, in the um, Superman movies, once Clark Kent, who was a Christ figure, puts on his cape, he is able to turn the earth backwards, Right? He can go backward to the moment in which the disaster happened and make it not have happened. So what the Course says in that part is you go back to that and then you say, I, I, did, I chose wrongly. I admit that I chose wrongly. I'm willing to choose again in this moment because remember, miracles are beyond time and space. The past is only in your head. Future is only in your head. I go back and then my favorite line, I will not feel guilty, for the Holy Spirit will remove all consequences of my wrong decisions if I will let him. And I choose to let him by allowing him to decide for God for me. That's why he says in the Course in Miracles, Jesus says, give me your past so I can change your mind about it for you. Else as I place my future in the hands of God. And all this work can only occur in the moment. But you can completely, you know, go through your past. I get it. I wasn't loving or I wasn't responsible or I didn't believe in myself or I didn't believe in someone else or whatever. I was reckless. I get it now. And that's, you know, it's not a call to course in fixing it. It's called a course in miracles. I never really recognized also there's a big movement around, well, I recognize that there's a big movement around spirituality with self-love. And I never really recognize that um, Jesus never, well, he said something quite the quite the opposite. And you pointed it's really out. It's really gotten out of hand. hand. <laughs> it's really gotten out of hand. You know, Louise Hay was my friend. Louise Hay was my friend, but I really believe that where she is now, she's saying, Miriam, tell them I, I went a little too far with that. You know, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. You know, I, I put in the book a story about there was a spiritual center and I was driving up to it and there was a sign, love yourself. And I was thinking, you know, that wasn't the message of Jesus. That Jesus was love others. You can't love yourself if you don't love others. Of course, in America, but although I admit you can't love others if you don't love yourself, it's a, it's a big both and. But what we think of loving ourselves, the way to really love yourself is to realize you're not who you think you are. One of, the, one of the lines in the workbook of the Course in Miracles that most attracted me to the Course was, is, I am as God created me. You were born innocent. You are innocent. Nothing you've ever done has altered your innocence because what God creates not only cannot be uncreated, it cannot be altered. So you don't love yourself because you've done everything right. You love yourself because who you really are has never wavered. It's just that you got confused at times. But the Course in Miracles says, do not look to yourself to find yourself. That's not where you are. So it's on our efforts to love one another and to forgive one another that we 
that we either find ourselves or lose ourselves. As a matter of fact, you were talking about crucifixion and resurrection. The Course in Miracles says every time you judge someone or attack someone, you're putting another nail in the cross of their crucifixion, but you're really crucifying yourself. Because if I choose to perceive the guilt in you, I will not be able to free myself from my own sense of my own guilt. And that, and this is another interesting thing. Let's say you're so enlightened that when I attack you, you don't give it back to me because you're too enlightened, you've moved, you've evolved, you get, that's not the way. The Course in Miracles says, even if you don't attack me back, I will feel like you did. Because subconsciously, I think I deserve it. So there's no escape. Whoa. No. That's really Hello. trippy. I love That's that one. That's really trippy. Hi there, guys. I wanted to take a quick moment just to introduce you to my one-to-one -one coaching. It's something that I deeply love doing. As you can tell, conscious conversation is such a massive part of my life. And having one-to-one -one deep, meaningful conversations with people where I get to show up as your brother or as the coach or as your mentor has been such a gift for me personally and a gift for lots of the people that I have supported on the journey of living a more spiritually empowered, spiritually powered, spiritually aligned life. You don't have to take my word for it. Here's some examples of people all around the world that have experienced profound transformations through this coaching experience. Amrit is a fantastic coach. In a few sessions, he got to a depth that I'd only experienced before working with certain medicines. And He's gone through a lot of the struggles that you're probably facing. And Amrit's been a really strong, supportive figure in my journey. In control of myself. I'm kinder to myself. I actually have that vision and a purpose. I do feel like I'm a better version of myself already. Amazing energy. He was easy to talk to, which made me easy to trust him. Working with Emmerich at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning, and really, I was bouncing out of bed. Whenever I get off the calls with Emmerich, best money we've ever spent. <laughs> I would not recommend him because I don't want everyone to know about him and then I won't be able to book him. If he gets too busy, I won't get my turn. I would say absolutely. There's no way you can work with Amrit for a period of time without being transformed. So if you're considering him as a coach, do not hesitate because you won't be disappointed. Alrighty, so hopefully that's inspiring your evolution onwards and upwards. And if you are so inspired to evolve, you can book in a one-to-one -one call with me directly at www amrit.coach forward slash life. And guys, if I can say so myself, I do think this is something quite special. Most people that I see building things online don't really work with people this deeply, this intimately, one on one as things start to grow, just because it is so time intensive. And yet I'm so deeply passionate about the transformation that comes from one to one coaching that just isn't available anywhere else. It would be my absolute honor and a pleasure to support your spiritual awakening, your spiritual path, your spiritual unfoldment. It is my life's work. I look forward to seeing you in the call. Back to today's podcast. Coming back to that point of, yeah, I must have chosen wrongly because I'm not at peace, just how much that helps us recognize where we've gone askew and and just coming back home to to rest. Um, you, you mentioned something earlier in terms of for us to even recognize that we're not at peace there's that moment where it's like oh i get it and i'm just kind of leading back into some of the themes in today's today's conversation where in order to even get it sometimes i feel like there's this we need just a little bit of presence just to, just to slow down just a little bit to to get it you know sometimes i feel like we're just rushing around from one thing to the next to the next to the next due to the nature of the way society is woven together at the moment um things seem to be speeding up in modern day Western collective living um, and Eastern living now, I would go as far as saying. And so in order to actually get things, sometimes it just requires you to state one of the things in the book um, is this just a little bit of morning time, just a little, and like the way you open it up, is just like, just take five, just take five. <laughs> like it's not even sit for 20, which is, you know, it's just, just take five. Um, just to hear your thoughts on slowing down and taking five. Most of us have had experiences, I know I have, where we've made mistakes and we've asked ourselves, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? Well, you weren't thinking. You were moving too fast. You didn't pray about it. You didn't sit quietly. You didn't reflect on it. 
You were just in this lo- lack of impulse control, which is the tenor of our society now, particularly given social media. Uh, Blaise Pascal, a French philosopher, said, every problem in the world stems from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Um, the Course in Miracles says, even five minutes spent with the Holy Spirit in the morning guarantees he will be in charge of your thought system throughout the day. And I've never read about any religious or spiritual tradition that did not emphasize the power of the morning. You wake up in the morning and you surrender your mind to one or the other. You either are directly onto Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, the news. You just gave away. Take my soul. Come on, come on. Fear, illusion, craziness, conflict, come on in. But if you fill your house with light, the darkness can't get in. If you go first to whatever your practice is, whether it's Course in Miracles, TM, whatever your meditation, whatever your mindfulness, whatever, then you see, I I heard Michael Beckwith say once, you begin to see the news as the world's prayer list. (laughs) Then you go back to the world. And you are fortified in your peace. And you're not only fortified in your peace when you go back into the world, but you take it with you to help bless others. Okay, so questions about um, the mystic Jesus. Do you think um, institutionalized uh, the story of Jesus that we've been mainstream introduced to i'm not sure what to call that type of jesus versus the mystic jesus um but that story of jesus do you reckon the forces at play that were perpetuating that story have intentionally um suppressed these nagamati texts and uh, the book of Tom, like these sort of things like have they intentionally tried to keep this out of the collective awareness and if so why well hundreds of years ago even thousands of years ago we know they did I mean, and there have been mystics who have been, were burned at the stake. I mean, obviously. But, and great evils have been perpetrated in the name of God, obviously. On the other hand, I had an experience about maybe 15 or 20 years ago. I was in a small town in England, and I was in a church, in an old church. And my thinking was was leaning in the direction of these people don't get it. You know, this is, this is the old fashioned stuff. And I really felt something in me just go, get off that high horse right now. There have been many sincere, deeply committed disciples of Christ within these walls as well. You, you know, you can't see what's happening inside people's hearts. There, I mean, there have been great saints within and are today, I believe. There are people finding their deep spiritual journey within religious institutions and outside religious institutions. And I don't think, you know, it's important that we not judge that because on one hand, the Inquisition, let's say, or Muhammad Atta yelling, God is great before he slits some flight attendant's throat. Obviously, great evil has been perpetrated in the name of God. Great evil has been perpetrated in the name of Jesus. Uh, the, the Course in Miracles says some bitter idols have been made uh, have been made of him who came only to be brother to the wall. However, let us also remember that people are assigned. You and I, in this conversation, life has assigned us to a conversation about these deep religious truths, but it's a podcast and a book. Neither of us in this moment are led to have this conversation within the context of a religious institution. But let's not kid ourselves. There are also people having what is in essence the same conversation within religious institutions because that's what they are, that's their ministry to help uplift and transform those institutions. So we ourselves are just attached to form if we think that we can judge based on external 
you know, because some in some of those religious institutions, that's where the soup kitchens are. That's where the ministries to the poor are. So, you know, spiritual superiority is one of the shadow sides of the spiritual journey. In the book, you brought us back to the etymology of the word religion, actually, and I'd never really Religio, contemplated it. Yeah. yeah. It comes from a Latin root to bind back. So Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. To bind back to the truth in our hearts. And, you know, Freud defined neurosis as separation from self. This world disconnects us from the truth of who we are. Real religion, the genuine spiritual path, reconnects us to the truth of who we are. You are host of a podcast. I'm an author. What is the truth here? We are souls saluting one another, here to acknowledge one another, here to pool our resources in order to create something together that is, that is more than we could have created by ourselves in order that we and others be blessed. You going to go for the real or the real? I love that. Yeah. There's um, also a question I had about um, what are your thoughts on the lost years of Jesus between, I think it's like there's about 12 and 30. Like there's just, we don't know, know what happened. I'm just so curious, Marianne. I've got to ask you. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know any more than anyone else does. I find the Urantia book fascinating. Have you seen the Urantia book? No, tell me more. Oh, yeah. You probably find the Urantia book very fascinating. Uh, it's kind of an encyclopedic universe of the universes. Um, I mean, there's so many stories with the in America, with the Glastonbury. It's was it with Mary Magdalene? I don't, I don't have any inside scoop on any of that. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I had to ask yeah. just because yeah, it's cosmic gossip that I've, I enjoy as much as anyone. But I don't, I, don't, I don't have the envelope to open for you. <laughs> my favorite, my but, favorite. What this um, book is about, yeah. what the Course of Miracles is about, and what I am about in my practice is not what happened two thousand years ago, but what's happening in this moment. Mm. Not that what happened two thousand years ago is not fascinating, because it is. Mm. But mm-hmm. the birth of Christ that the mystic Jesus is about is, do I give him birth in any moment? Do I give birth to the consciousness of the innocent child? Um, that's the manger. The manger is our heart. Mary is the feminine within us, awakened in the middle of the night, meaning in the night of our own dark night of the soul, told to go up onto the roof into the realms of consciousness of prayer and prayerfulness, the angel Gabriel, angel of the thoughts of God, she's told something is going to be born within you, meaning you're going to become a new person. God himself will impregnate you if you say yes, and out of your, the fathered by God, mothered by your humanness, you are going to become a person, the Christ within you, who is Father by, the, by God, mother by your humanness, both human and divine, and you, heaven and earth, shall become as one because you will be a grounded human being but thinking only the thoughts of heaven. And this Christ within you, which will is you reborn in any moment that you do not bring your past with you, be as a newborn child. The three kings represent the powers of the world. You will no longer be vulnerable. You will no longer have to bow to the powers of the world because the powers of the world will bow to you and so on and so on and so on. So that's not just about his life 2,000 years ago, which is not to minimize the magnificence of that, but it is the story born and reborn, acted and reenacted every moment in our own lives. It is the greater mystery and the, the true mystical meaning of it all. Yeah, and just to give you guys an insight that are tuning in, this is a quick little insight what Marianne just shared into how the book is written and there's actually 50 maybe more stories like this where the the actual meaning, the mystical meaning behind the happenings of the of Christ's journey um, has been unpacked and it is it is so rich and so succinctly yet beautifully written and just everything that it's portrayed and yeah it literally feels like I'm not sure if that is the essence of Corpus Christi but like there's just that it, just the bite-sized chunks in which you can actually digest so much wisdom and it leaves you a lot to reflect on um, I will put a link to the book um, in the show notes below for everybody to go grab your hands uh, on along with um, Marianne's uh, the rest of Marianne's catalog of books now Marianne you are a 
by faith uh, Jewish and then you're writing about Jesus. I, I just wanted to use that as a quick little sort of segue to just interfaith dialogue at a time like we're living in now. Like you said, you, you, you're you invested in the time we're in now um, and where things are at. Um, what do you see going on in the world around interfaith dialogue at the moment? Yeah, I, like are things breaking through? Are they breaking down? It just seems, I don't know, I'm just, yeah. When I've been involved in interfaith dialogues, yeah. I'm representing my silo, but aren't I cool? I'm sitting next to you representing your silo. I'm sitting next to you representing your silo. This is why I'll I give asked. you an example <laughs> of something that happened many years ago. There was a man named Larry King who is no longer with us, but he was um, he had a television show. I don't know if it showed in Australia. It probably did. Yes, it's And yes, pretty famous. much every night everybody was watching it. It was a very, very influential TV program. And I was asked to be on it with several ministers and rabbis. Was there a rabbi? I think there was a rabbi. It was ministers, priests, rabbis. I think it was before we, you know, so much of the really expansiveness of an imam or a mufti or anything. So I don't think the Muslims were there. This was before 9 11 and before so much of that consciousness. But there were different denominations religious, Jewish, and Catholic. And, okay. So. Somebody told me later, there was a man named Oral Roberts, and he was a very conservative Christian, a real precursor of the whole Christian conservative movement in the United States. I was told later that he had told his congregation, get on television, watch Larry King tomorrow night, I'm going to be arguing with a new ager, meaning me. Okay. The show, and I think that they were producing the show from a place of, oh, they're all going to fight. Okay. So the night of the show, I'm in my green room, and I walk over to a green room, and all the guys, all the men, thank you, were sitting in a circle talking. No one had invited me in, but it was all the other men who were going to be on the show. And I said to them, y'all want to pray together before we go out? And they went, uh, uh, yeah, I guess we should. So we sat there. And we all prayed. And we prayed that we'd be vessels of light and God's love, whatever. We go on to Larry King and we blew his mind because all we were doing was complimenting one another. All we were doing was loving up. And he said and during the break, what is going on here? And Oral Roberts went over to me and said, you're such a sweet soul. And everybody was, yes, oh, as the Jews say, as the Catholics say. And he was like, well, what? You know, the producers, well, what happened to you guys? <laughs> but most interfaith dialogue is at a level that would have occurred had we not prayed together. You know, that worldly stuff. But the Course in Miracles says if even one person comes into a situation that says whoever is saying at the time, with a true prayerful attitude, then anything can be used for the purposes of love. So I've seen it be both ways. I've seen interfaith dialogues where nobody left their silo, nobody left their really having been touched by any meaningful transmission. But I've also had experiences such as that night where the walls came down, nobody felt the need to protect their silo, and the oneness of God's truth, which is love, was more obvious. Um, I wish I had, I'm sure today would be a DHS copy. Um, it was a night I won't forget. And I remember how blown away he was. He's like, what's going on? I can picture Larry looking for the confrontation. I've, I know I've watched Larry he King's stuff. Trying to get us to like fight, and we we're like, oh, yeah, I can picture it. him looking says. for the contentious points and not quite getting <laughs> uh -huh. to where he where he wanted in there. The the power of prayer. Um, Ernst Holmes, uh, the science of mind, was a real game starter for me when it came to prayer. Um, beautiful book um, about illuminating the mind. Absolutely, and yeah, just, of course. It says prayer is the medium of miracles. I just want to get your hear you talk about our prayer. Mind. <laughs> yeah. The altar is inside our mind. So what you put on the altar is then altered. If I put a relationship on the altar, it's my way of saying I'm willing to have higher thoughts. 
I'm willing to see the innocence in the other person. I'm willing for them to see the innocence in me. I just place this on the altar. I am willing to see this differently. And the whole idea of Jesus or any other, you know, image of the Holy Spirit is what the Course defines as a divine intercession from a thought system beyond our own. Sometimes it's like we can't do it ourselves. The trigger is too deep. The, the trauma, the wound, we just can't give it up. Our grievance, the Course in Miracles says you can have a grievance or a miracle. You cannot have both. And um, it's nice, more than nice, to know that a moment of prayer can so shift you on the deepest subconscious level that you become able to see something experience, and experience something that you could not have seen or experienced before. Because in a world that is so yang, it can feel that prayer is just so yin of an approach. And yet I wholeheartedly acknowledge the way you've written the book. At the end, and I, I highly recommend if people are so inclined to get the audio book as well, because you have the meditative um, practices and the prayer practices in there. And you're actually guiding us through very short, sharp, poignant, but to the point prayer. And I have to say, I'm a big fan of the way that it was introduced in the audio book as well, because you've kind of got this chapter on which, like, let's say forgiveness, which really hones in the point of this is really like, you know, hopefully people tuning into the podcast today, it's the illusion that breaks you free from the illusion. You ready? Let's go. And then you introduce us and drop us into this incredible prayer, right? And so I think that really, 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 I just wanted to, because I know you and, you know, the rubber gloves are always on and the sleeves are always up, <laughs> ready to tackle into the next thing, yeah? And, you know, just uh, just a moment for those that the book's written as an actionable book, definitely, whilst also beautifully conveying, you know, all the stories that it helps us digest the wisdom that it's trying to illuminate. That that piece where for people that feel like prayer is just another yin thing, you know, can you just speak to that for a moment as well, please, Marianne? When you were, and thank you, first of all, when you were talking a minute ago about the yin and the yang, so sometimes people ask, well, why is God talked about as he? Well, we, for the same reason we talk about Mother Earth. Nobody ever says, well, why do we talk about Mother Earth? Why don't we talk about Father Earth? It's archetypes. It's not genitals that we're talking about here. So it's like in the, in the, um, in the Eastern philosophies, yang is the spirit masculine force. Yin is the earth feminine force. So Mary is the yin receiving the yang, which is the penetration by spirit. And that's why in prayer and meditation, you're open to receive the penetrating yang spirit force entering into your heart. And so the, the, the Mary principle is the feminine within all of us. With that, what is your hope? What is your big prayer for having written this book, sharing with the world at this particular time? We talked a lot about the breakdown that is currently going on. What is, is there a hope that Marianne's carrying for this time? For you know? We don't need a majority of the world to change. We need a critical mass. And I think there's a tremendous spiritual revolution going on at this time. As you know, you're in the field. Um, Everywhere on the planet right now, there's somebody having a conversation not dissimilar to the one you and I are having right now. Yeah. And we have to remember that. The issue is, while there are far more people who love than who hate, those who hate, hate with conviction. And conviction is a force multiplier. So there are, if there are 10 people acting, a uh, planning acts of hate. And there are a hundred people talking about love, but not planning acts of love. <clears throat> then the acts of hate will continue to rule the day. My hope is that enough of us, that we keep having enough of these conversations and that enough people rise to the urgency of this moment in time 
because it is a race for time. And your children, my children, my grandchild, I don't think the cataclysm would take place in my lifetime. But we need to be very serious about what our children and grandchildren experience. So that would be my hope. Um, it's the eleventh hour, but it's not midnight yet. Um, God's ready. The issue is whether we are. Marianne Williamson. Just, I love you so much. I just want to say, Sister Bear, because <laughs> it's just uh, the, well, it's just how affectionately it pops out of me. It's always, man. It is just. Beyond a pleasure, it is always such a treat, um, not just for the mind and the body, but really for the soul. So enriching. Every time we connect, I, I leave with so much um, to contemplate further. And like I said, the book, the audio book, Absolute Gems, as always, links in the description for everybody to access them below. If, yeah, you know, and to, to summarize, one of the things I would say is, uh, reading the book, you have championed faith, love, and service so deeply that uh, I'm looking at the values of the podcast going, maybe they need an update <laughs> to faith, love, and service. <laughs> and so, as always, very influential, very inspiring. And as, like I said before, your rubber gloves are always on, sleeves are always up, calling us into the power of love. And, yeah, just so grateful for you writing the book, for sharing yourself so abundantly here with us today. And as always, it stands on the shoulders of, I guess, just the incredible work that is your life's work and the Course of Miracles and so many of the influential teachers that have supported you on your path. Thank you so much for doing this with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor and I thank you for your generosity and thank you for the conversation. Last time you were on, something you said for me, Marianne, has completely changed my life. And I actually quote you a lot on this in multiple other podcasts. You said, it's a spiritual practice of mine to know that the future is best looked after by me focusing as much of my resources as I can into the present moment. Uh -huh. And the operative word that I keep coming back to is practice. <laughs> uh -huh. You know? And what the I, Course I, in Miracles calls the holy instant, that the past is only in your mind, the future is only in your mind. If you carry shadow figures from your past into the present, you're dooming your, your programming and thus dooming your future to be just like it. Then your ego mm -hmm. mind will say nothing ever changes. And that's why I even mentioned in this one, you are born again, meaning you can begin again in any moment that you don't bring the past with you. And it is, it takes practice, it takes discipline. <laughs> Because the ego mind is obsessed with past or future. The ego mind doesn't want you to be fully in the present. Because yeah. in the mo if, when you're fully present in the moment, your mm. ego is dead. Mm. So the ego says, no, don't go there. And then you figure <laughs> it out. No, you don't want me. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. if you're in the present, you're present. The you is present. Ego has gone. The light, the darkness cannot be where there is fully light. If I'm told, that's why mindfulness, the idea I'm fully focused on what's happening in this moment, my ego has no power. That has stood. Easier said than done. It will, and that's the, and again, the operative word being practice. The operative mm -hmm. word being practice. So epic. Like, thank you so much for that. There's a line from Martin Luther King mm. uh, Love without power is weak and anemic, mm. and power without love is reckless and abusive. Yeah. And that really stood tall for me because I think so many of us with a spiritual movement in mind are inclined to turn the other cheek from a place of docileness, right, rather than like really stepping Soft into, the belly. go on, have another crack. You're going to tire eventually, aren't you? Keep going, <laughs> you know, and that's a well, very well. different kind of power that animates you. So I never really considered your dynamic with your parents, because you were quite open about it in the book. It's like, um, you know, there's a Jewish girl writing about a Jesus book. And it's a, like your, your dad kind of going. Yeah, and, I wrote in the book. <laughs> same God, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. They were a little like, my, my mother used to say, I'd come on the phone and my mother would say to my father, your daughter, the Pope is on the line. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
My goodness. <laughs> Man, thank you so much. Hey there, you. Thank you so much for tuning in all the way through to the end of another episode. Now, this particular conversation with Marianne was incredible. As you'll know, we referenced multiple other conversations. I'm about to pop them up on screen for you to be able to go into those conversations if you haven't heard them already. They've been very well loved by the audience. This is the third time back she's around. Now, also on screen will be the opportunity for you to dive and take your journey further into the Inspired Evolution. But just quickly before I pop them up on screen, do take a moment to subscribe to the channel. Everything you see here is powered and empowered by your subscription to the channel. Thank you so much in advance for your incredible love and support. Now on screen, like we said, these options for you to take your journey with Marianne or the Inspired Evolution and the Inspired Evolution further. I'll see you in the next one.